Brothers and sisters, it's my honor to ask our distinguished guest, Sheikh Daud Bhai, please. My brothers, my sisters, my friends, our leaders, our uh, you know, fellow Canadians, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, first off, it's a pleasure to be here. Alhamdulillah, that was a very interesting uh, you know, introduction. Alhamdulillah, I went into detail perfume and sunglasses and everything, mashallah. Alhamdulillah, that was really nice. Um, and I find, you know, a lot of the time when, when, when we're being heard, or when someone is speaking about us and we're hearing that, we're listening to someone else say something about us, really what they're doing is pulling out the history of our life, right? Just expressing something about us. And that's what's really interesting because none of us, I'm assuming most of us, don't really like hearing much about ourselves. We do what we do, and we do it sincerely. We don't like to seek praise in, or anything of that sort in what we're doing. But when we hear something about ourselves, sometimes it makes us straighten ourselves out because we're like, you know what, nah, I need to make sure I you know, continue doing the good things that I do in my life and don't fall short. So Jazakumullah khairan for that. Uh, thank you for having me here, alhamdulillah. I want to begin um, by asking a question. And this is an interesting question because it has to do with the recent trip that I made to Australia. And I've been to Australia now almost, I think, 25 or 26 times. Uh, you know, and some of you are like, wow, right? It's like boring going to Australia now, alhamdulillah, except when you get a nice halal kangaroo burger, right? <laughs> um, but I want to ask you a question. If I was to say, describe what a Canadian looks like, what would you say? Just think about that. asking you to actually say things out loud, just think about it. Because on, the, on my recent trip to Australia, what happened was, we were sitting down, we were talking to some people, and one of the, one of the, you know, the, the, the brothers that we were sitting with, he said, yeah, you even look Canadian. And I'm like, really? I look Canadian? He's like, yeah, you look like a Canadian. I'm like, we don't even know what a Canadian looks like in Canada. So that's really interesting. How you as an Australian know what a Canadian looks like. He's like, no, you look like a Canadian. And I'm like, okay. So I asked him to describe that. And I won't get into the entire conversation, but what was really interesting in it was that he was pointing out the fact that I don't look like a typical, I would say, someone who came from, like my dad, who came from Pakistan originally, right? I don't look like someone who is still trying to learn the culture. And I assume that he's also highlighting my skin tone, which my mother is Portuguese, so I'm not, you know, I don't have full Pakistani blood in me. I know some of you are like saying, Dola, Dola, you know, like, oh, right? But no, you know, my mother is Portuguese, my father is Pakistani. And so when I was in Australia and he asked me, and he said, you know, you look like a Canadian. And I was like, well, what's your definition of a Canadian? Because in Canada, technically, if you focus on the First Nations, we understand the First Nations, but everyone other than the First Nations, who are they? If we were to look at all of the population of Canada other than the First Nations, and I went to school with many Mohawk friends, a lot of my friends growing up are Mohawks, right? So if you mess with me, you're messing with Mohawks, right? They got my back. And SubhanAllah, other than them, Really, when you describe a Canadian, you describe someone whose ancestry, whether first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation, goes back to another country. So we're technically not really from here, but now we are from here. So for example, if I was to say, where am I from? 
some of you would say, well, you're from Pakistan and Portugal, right? And I did this. I tried this with some students in Quebec City. I sat down a group of about 20 students, youth, at the mosque where the shooting happened last year. And I was doing a youth program with them. And I asked them, about 20 of these youth, most of them in their teenage years, where are you from? One of them said Tunisia, the other one said Morocco, another said Algeria, one said from Afghanistan, the other one said from Pakistan. And I just went from one to the other, and I asked all of them, and only one said, I'm from Quebec City. And then I asked, where were you born? And out of the 20 of them, about three of them were born outside of Canada, all of them were born in Canada. Now that tells you a lot about Muslims in Canada. As Muslims in Canada, many of us who had come from other countries, right, feel that we will never really and truly be Canadian. We may have a Canadian passport, we may have Canadian citizenship, we may have Canadian, you know, a uh, PR status within Canada. We may be in the process of, of doing immigration and paperwork and so on. But even once we've become Canadian, for many they don't feel Canadian when they walk the streets. And that's trickling down in our children. Our children who are born here in Canada, if you ask them where you're from, many of the children in this room will actually say the, 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 the name of the country where the parents come from, not where they are from. And that's because of culture more than it is because of religion. Because our religion doesn't really have a country. Islam is not Saudi Arabia. Islam is not Malaysia. Islam is not Pakistan. Islam is not Indonesia, right? That has the highest population of Muslims in the world. Islam is international. Islam is a faith, it's a belief, it's in us. And it doesn't matter where on earth we are, it has no boundaries. So what's beautiful about Islam is that when someone comes and says, you look, you look like a Canadian, at the end of the day, alhamdulillah, I'm still a Muslim. I may be a Canadian, I may be Portuguese, I may be Pakistani, I may be from some other country, but the, at the end of the day, I'm a Muslim. Now, I want to fast forward a little bit from that. I was boarding my flight this morning in Toronto to come here, and I have a Nexus card, right? Alhamdulillah, benefits of being Canadian, right? Born and raised. Even though I studied in Saudi Arabia, they gave it to me, right? <laughs> uh, so I have a Nexus card, and I was going through the Nexus line, and the CBSA agent, right? The border agent there, the Canadian border agent, she was standing there, an elderly lady, her name was Salwa, and she was wearing a hijab and a long abaya with her uniform jacket on and her badge and her name and the patches on her shoulders and everything, right? The badges on her shoulders, not patches, badges, right? So an official agent, as in working for our safety and protection, she takes my boarding pass and my Nexus card. She looks at it, she says, hello, how are you? I'm like, good, assalamu alaikum. She says, oh, I'm sorry, you look like a Muslim, but I didn't want to judge you. You see the difference? In Australia, I look like a Canadian, right? <laughs> to this border agent, I look like a Muslim, but she didn't want to judge me. And that's beautiful, that as Canadians, even though we're Muslim, we don't judge one another. Our deen, Islam teaches us before anything else. We know that we teach that to our children as a basic principle in our belief, that we don't judge one another. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he was sent as a mercy to all of the creation, to everything on earth, not only human beings, but even to this, to the table, to the trees, to everything. Because we are taught to respect, we are taught to look after this world and this life and the provisions that God has given to us. <laughs> in the Qur'an that we haven't sent you except that you are a mercy to mankind, not that you're a terrorist. 
And so when we look at who we are as Muslims, and we look at how we're being portrayed in the media, and we look at who we are inside of our homes, and how we're treated on the streets, it can be very different, but inside we are the same. Inside, like, you know, a non-Muslim friend of mine was telling me last week, we all, we all bleed red. Regardless of our race, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of our faith or belief, we all bleed red. And so at the end of the day, our responsibility is to look after each other, to take care of one another, and our Prophet was sent as a mercy to everyone and everything that existed. So this lady, the border agent, when she's saying, you know, I didn't want to judge you, I actually felt good. I was like, you know what, I'm going to include this in my lecture because as a Muslim, she was not judging anyone. She knew that I was Muslim, she felt it, but she didn't want to say anything. And I gave her salam, and even if she didn't, there's no issue with that because she greeted me in a nice manner. And we learned that as well. Our Prophet teaches us to greet people nicely. Our Qur'an, our book teaches us to greet people nicely. Allah tells us in the Qur'an, God says, if someone who's ignorant calls out to you in a, in a disrespectful manner, someone who's ignorant yells at you, swears at you, treats you, you know, in a bad way, respond to them peacefully. The believer responds in a nice way. And so we are people who are here to spread a nice, beautiful message. That message includes a way of life. It includes an identity, but it doesn't have borders. Now I want to bring this to January of this year. January of this year, I was uh, blessed with the opportunity to go to Lakhlamish which is in northern Alberta, which is said to be the oldest Muslim community in Canada, or one of them. They claim that it is the oldest. Let's leave it at that. We know that Masjid Rashid, the mosque in Edmonton, is the oldest or first mosque in all of North America, and about three hours' drive north of that is a small town known as Lac Labiche. And when I was there earlier this year, what was really interesting was that I met so many Muslims, but they didn't really look Muslim. As in the men, I'm talking about the, you know, the brothers, the men that I met with initially in the first few hours when I saw them, you know, they were nice, they were respectful, and I felt good, welcome, and everything was perfectly fine. The reason why I say, they were Muslim, but I didn't know or didn't feel like they were Muslim, was because we as human beings, even though we try not to judge others, it's in us because society, and especially the media, it's tailored us to naturally, internally judge someone. And so when I met these people that were there, you know, I met Mo, who was Muhammad, the owner of the IGA, whose grandfather came to Canada, was one of the people to establish that city. And they were the sole owners of any grocery store in the entire city for many, many years, for decades, really, until now a superstore opened up, and it's slowly knocking them out of business, right? So we should always go shop at their IGA, right? But Sipala, what's really interesting is that this was someone whose grandfather came. So his father was born here, and he was born here. His mom was born here, his dad was born here, his siblings were born in Canada. And so when you speak to him, you don't hear an accent. And that to me was really interesting. Because usually, you know, when I meet people and I talk to them, they're like, oh, you don't really have an accent. I'm like, yeah, because I'm born and raised in Canada. And I actually speak French as well, because I'm born and raised in Montreal. And so, you know, for me, it's normal. But when I meet other people, a lot of the time when we're dealing with the community, we meet people and we hear that there's an accent. Or we can tell that they're, you know, not from here based on maybe, you know, skin tone or their features. You're like, you know, this person is from Afghanistan, you know. And this morning I had an Uber driver take me to the airport and he was from Afghanistan. I sat down and I'm like, yeah, Afghanistan, right? He's like, yes, how did you know? I'm like, because you drove me to the airport once before. <laughs> You know, but what's really interesting is that we hear accents and we can pick it up. I love cultures, but when I got to Lac La I was shocked because I couldn't figure out the culture. And the culture was 
poutine. <laughs> it was the Canadian culture. As in, these were people who have been living there for over a hundred years, born and raised, pray five times a day, and I was leading Jum'ah, I, I led the Friday prayers, I was the one doing the sermon, and sitting in the audience was the mayor of the city. A Muslim. Born and raised right there, lack of vision. So it was really interesting because they took me from business to business to business, and I was like, okay, well, this is owned by a Muslim, and the KFC is owned by a Muslim, and the Taco Bell is owned by a Muslim, and I'm like, wow, all these places, are, that's amazing, the Muslims own all of these things. The garbage disposal company, owned by a Muslim, the water distribution, owned by a Muslim, I was like, this is super cool. And I felt for once, yeah, Muslims are putting themselves on the map. But we do that every single day. Every single one of us, whether we are Muslim or not, are putting ourselves on the map. As in, we are working towards bettering society. And really, when we think of the history of Muslims in Canada, it can go back to 130, 140 years. But technically, we continue to create history. We are living history right now. There will be a time, and I'm pretty sure, that this will be used as an example. I'll use this as an example. Many others will use this as an example. Our children will use this as an example in the future. They will say, you know what, we came to the mosque and we listened to someone, and you know what, we actually understood what he was saying. You have, you know, Sheikh Yahya here, alhamdulillah, when he speaks, you can understand it. And if we go back a few years, the initial set of Muslims that came into the country, let's focus on what they did. They came to Canada. Many of them, at the very beginning, when they came to Canada, they were shy of their culture. The women would never dress like you're dressed. The men, they would not, they, most of them would not have a beard. They wouldn't wear a topi on their head, right, or a hat on their head. They wouldn't wear their traditional clothing because they were shy. If you look at the pictures of the first Muslims that came to Canada, even up until the 60s, my father-in-law came, you know, to Montreal, his, his brother went to Montreal, his older brother in the 60s, they were all wearing suits and ties. Suits and ties, clean shaven, if you look at them, you're like, Oh, okay, they look like the average person in society, but as soon as you talk to them, it's like, oh, sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> it's like, okay, wait a second, where are you coming from, right? They were shy to show their culture. They were shy to show their Islam outside in public. And that's fine initially, because if we go back and we rewind to the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he started to practice and to preach Islam in the city of Mecca, that's exactly what they did. For the first three years, Islam was to be spread through friends. Because society was not ready to accept it yet. And so the Prophet, he went to his wife and he told his wife, I'm a Prophet, I received the revelation, and she believed in him because she knew that he is a Sadiq al-Amin, he's the truthful one, the trustworthy one, he doesn't tell lies. And he received this revelation, and they knew that in their scriptures this was going to happen. And so she went with him to, him, to her cousin, and then he went to his friend Abu Bakr, and he went to Ali, and he spoke to a few people that were close to him, and they began to practice Islam, but not publicly. And if you look at the first Canadians that came to Canada, as, sorry, the first Muslims that came to Canada, right, and the second generation of Muslims as well, they would not show their Islam in public. Islam was only inside of the masjid. Prayer in the masjid. As soon as you go out, oh, I look like everyone else. Now, Islamically, what's really interesting, and I'm going to talk about the clothing very soon, right? Because if you look at me right now, right, you probably think, okay, is he really an imam? Right? And I know, I know many people, many Canadians, many Muslims around the world, and I traveled constantly. Last year I took 78 flights, this year I'm already at 42 or something like that, flights, right? All over the world. When I travel, and I go and I give a lecture like this, people are like, you sure you're an imam? Because imams don't wear pants and shirts. Well, in our country, this is how we dress. 
If you go to other countries, you will see in Pakistan someone wearing a shalwar kameez. If you go to an Arab country like Morocco, they're not going to be wearing the Saudi clothing, they're going to be wearing the Moroccan clothing, right? If you go to Saudi Arabia, they'll be wearing the Saudi you know, gown or the cloak. If you go to Malaysia, they're wearing the baju melayu and the baju koron, right? Because I used to live in Malaysia, I lived there for four years doing my masters. So subhanAllah, Islam is really interesting because we have certain principles that we follow, but that doesn't mean that we all have to be a carbon copy of the other. And the Prophet وسلم, peace be upon him, he sent his message to us to live by, but in that message there are so many things that teach us how to be flexible with the societies that we live in, while at the same time never ever jeopardizing our belief in God. Never. And at times, certain things to do with culture, to do with clothing, to do with food, does jeopardize our belief. Even if you look at food, we eat halal food. If you go to other parts of the world, I've been to other places in Canada where you can't find halal food. If you go to northern Canada, it's very difficult to find halal food. My, my father's friend from Senegal, he raised us when we were children, because my dad had no family in Canada, right? No Muslim family. And so, the brothers and sisters in the community, they were our relatives. They became our uncles and aunties. So I had an uncle from Senegal, I had an uncle you know, from, from uh, India, I had another uncle from Guyana, right? And obviously they were married, so they had their wives as well, girls, you know, all around the uncles, right? Because they just treat us all the time really nice, right? <laughs> and it's in, like discipline us, right? Not treat us really nice. It was the aunties that give us all the nice stuff, right? Anyways, brothers are like, <laughs> but they raised us. So this brother from Senegal, he went up north, right? He went to a First Nation reserve. And while he was living there, he decided to take this contract as a principal of their school. And he's from Senegal. So he's, you know, really dark skinned. And subhanAllah, when he went there, they were like, oh, look at this man. They're just shocked. They're like, where did he come from? They never saw a black man before in their life. Never. They're so secluded, so far away from the rest of the world. They, to them, this was amazing. And what's really interesting is when he came back and he was telling us his story, he's like, you know, the rest of the world, we know the racism towards the blacks, right? We know how it is, and especially you know, in some parts of the world, it's very bad and disgusting, really. But subhanAllah, he was like, when I went there, they treated me like I was a king. They did everything for me. They even chartered a flight to bring halal meat, frozen meat, from Montreal to his village where, they, where he was living. Halal meat. It was amazing how he was treated. And that's because he held on to his, his Islamic values and principles. And that's what differentiates us. Our differences are not differences in color, they're not differences in race, they're not differences in anything. The only difference is our taqwa, our belief, even amongst us, is that deep down we believe in something and others are entitled to their belief as well. And God teaches us that. In the Quran, La ikraha fi God says that there is no compulsion in the deen. Don't force someone to be a Muslim. Don't force another person, but live as a beautiful example. And they will see through you that you have good values, that you talk nice, that you are clear, that you are understandable, that you are someone who's respectful, that you are someone who helps another. And all of those things were taught to us by the Prophet, peace be upon him. When you look at the key principles that he teaches us, respect your neighbors, respect your guests, you will not be a true believer until you love for your brother or your sister what you love for yourself. You will not be a true believer until you do ikram towards your neighbor, until you respect and look after and treat your neighbor in a nice way. You will not be a true believer until you help the guest. You will not be a true believer until you help the traveler. These are all key principles in our belief. But in Canada, 
That's what allows us to have our identity. I can be a Muslim, and my example to the non-Muslims is one of respect, is one of honor, is one of good treatment, because that's what helps us to spread this deen or this religion to other countries. Now let's bring it a little bit closer to 2018. I want you to raise your hand if you are under the age of 30. Raise them high so we can all see how little amount of under 30s we have here. Right? See that? There's a reason why I'm doing this. Okay, now put your hands down. I know, I see some people cheating, but like, I consider myself under 30. Right? And that sister all the way in the back. Even. Now raise your hand if you're over 30. Don't be shy. I'm over 30. <laughs> And see how quick they put their hands down, they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> no one needs to know, right? Why are we doing that? Where is the younger generation of Muslims? When we talk about Islamic history, the first set of Muslims that came in, as I said, they were a little bit shy in showing their Islam, but what they did was they established mosques. They established the, pray the place of prayer. And that was great. Eventually they started to feel a little more confident because there were more Muslims around. And they started to marry into families, like my dad married into a family of Roman Catholics, right? My mother was Roman Catholic and later she accepted Islam. When, after marriage, when she was pregnant with my eldest brother. Uh, I know many examples of many Muslims who married into non-Muslim families. Because they came to this country and who else are they going to marry? People from this country. But what we see, fast forward, is that now we have a generation of people who are born and raised here. Now what is my identity? As a Muslim in Canada, what do I look like? And when we talk about identity, a lot of the time it's lost. Because us as Canadians, you know, when I go to the UK and people say, what's your national dish in Canada? I'm like... Curry. <laughs> <laughs> right? But if you go to the UK and you ask them, what's your national dish? What do you think it is? Fish and chips. Pakistani food. It's <laughs> not fish and chips anymore. Go do your research. No, no. Chicken karai. <laughs> it's Pakistani food. Yes, the national dish. Can you imagine that? That's amazing. But what, show, what we see there is that subhanAllah, a nation has adopted, they've accepted something that tastes really good. And similarly, you know, we can live in a country with people who accept us as Muslims. Why? Because we are really good. We're really good people, alhamdulillah. The problem is the media just makes us look bad, and we don't want to talk about that tonight. What I want to focus on, though, is once that first generation established masajid, mosques, right? Masajid is plural for masjid, and masjid is a mosque, right? those places of worship, once they were established, what we saw after that is that many Muslims started to come to the mosque, started to bring their children to the mosque, their children started to learn Arabic, started to memorize the Quran, and then once they turn 15 years old, they leave the mosque. And they go off to university, and they become professionals, and we don't see them anymore. Why? That brings me to the part of this lecture where I share a little bit of what I see us needing in the future. And currently, currently as well as moving forward. Right now as a Muslim community, what we're missing out on is something that retains our youth. And that's not because, you know, they're becoming professionals. That's great. Islamically, we are allowed to become lawyers. We're allowed to become doctors. We're allowed to become engineers. We're allowed to become teachers. We're allowed to, you know, do many things in life. Have to know, we have to provide for our families. But what we see missing is an understanding of our religion. And it's beautiful to see here in Burnaby, and I've said this before in this mosque, it's beautiful to see you know, not only this mosque, but the BCMA itself taking that initiative to invite the community together. And when I say community, I don't just mean the Muslim community, the Muslims living in society. 
I mean all of the people, that our doors are open, that you can come and see what we do. Come and witness us praying. Come and listen to our lectures. Come and ask us questions. Come and see what we do. But our younger generation, a lot of them are very shy. They're shy to do that. And that's because they're going through the same stages as the first generation Muslims. They're shy. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that us as Muslims, we held on to too much of our back home culture and didn't allow our children to understand and listen to them and understand from them the society that they're living in. And that's why you see a lot of young Muslims today missing from this lecture. There's like 20 people under the age of 30 sitting here. Why? I was recently in Pakistan, or the way my dad says in Pakistan, right? I was recently in Pakistan. It was the first trip in my life that I made to Pakistan. The very first trip. I was invited there for a conference. I get invited all the time, but I always decline. Because I'm like, you know, if I go to Pakistan, I'm going to have trouble going to the US. And if I have trouble going to the US, then Canada's going to give me issues, then the UK, then Singapore, then every other country, right? But, alhamdulillah, because of the Trudeau government, we can go wherever we want now, right? So, <laughs> it was a little joke. So I went to Pakistan for the first time. I agreed to go. 70% of the population in Pakistan is under the age of, I think it's 25 years old. 70%. So I'm doing a lecture and I'm like, where are all the uncles and aunties, right? Where is the older generation? I didn't see them. What was really beautiful there was that they held on to their culture, but they also allowed them to go in society and learn. And so I was giving a lecture in English and I had thousands of people in front of me listening to me in English, in another country, in a foreign country. And I was thinking to myself, who's gonna come and listen to my lecture when I'm speaking English? They're gonna say, oh, shame, he doesn't speak Urdu. What is his problem? His parents failed. Right? And I'm like, no, they came. Then they were like, we want to listen to this Pakistani Canadian dude, right? And they came and they listened. And I asked myself, there's something in their culture that allowed them to still feel comfortable. That's because they were still in their country and their population is so great. But here, we need to understand what our youth are going through. That's one of the reasons why I dress like this most of the time. Because I want our youth to feel it's okay to wear pants and shirts. It's okay for us to, 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 as long as we're following the guidelines of Islam, right? And we know what those are, that our, our, our body is covered, our private areas are covered, what we're wearing is loose and modest, right? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as we follow the guidelines of Islam. But what happened traditionally was that our children would go to the mosque, and they would be told by imams who came from other countries, what it's like to be a Muslim, based on their countries. And so when I graduated from Medina, as an example, in 2010, this was the summer of 2010, I graduated from Medina, went back to Canada, and I was working. I was working a job until I left to go to Malaysia to do my master's degree. And I finished work, and I went to the mosque to pray Asl prayer. And I remember it like it was today. I got to the mosque, and about three uncles, right, elderly brothers in the community, they came to me, and they're not all Pakistanis, so don't think I'm bashing Pakistanis, right? I love Pakistan, beautiful country, I love the food, biryani, mashallah, A1, right? I make the best chai, by the way, if you want chai, come see me in my house, right? These uncles came to me, and they were like, shame. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, you graduated from Medina, and you come to the mosque like this? Like what? You know? And I made sure they even put my topi, my hat on my head, even though we don't have to, right? Technically, tonight I wouldn't have, but I went for Hajj recently and I shaved my head and my hair's kind of like not grown in yet, so it doesn't really look nice, right? But technically, I don't even have to put my hat on my head. So when I went to the mosque and I was about to pray, they were like, how can you pray like this? You graduated from Medina? You didn't study, you didn't graduate. You can't pray like this. And I was like, yes, you can. And one of the brothers, he pulled me aside. And this brother, 
an amazing brother. He's known me since I was a child. Now he's in his late 80s. He held my arm really tight and he brought me to the side. He said, Joe, go home and put on like a thobe or put on a shawat kameez and come back. I was like, no, uncle, no. I don't need to. I'm not doing anything wrong. Allah doesn't, he's not upset with me to pray this way. Shouldn't God be happy that I'm praying? Shouldn't God be happy that I'm in the masjid? Shouldn't God be happy that I'm submitting to him when he's asking me to submit in prayer? And I already know that these are the right things because I studied for so many years. I studied in a Dadar Urbum, which is like uh, an Indian Pakistani madrasa, like a school, right? So I got that culture. And then I studied in Medina, and then I studied afterwards in Malaysia, so I understand the different cultures. So I was challenging them, but the problem is, we don't have enough people who are going to ask. And that's one thing that we need to change moving forward, is that our Islamic history has taught us, you just do what we tell you. And that's wrong to consider it Islamic history. The Muslims who have come here have come from other countries. It is a cultural thing. It has nothing to do with Islam. Why? Because Allah tells us in the Quran, Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So we're allowed to ask. But growing up, simple example, my brother wore a Montreal Canadiens hockey jersey to the mosque one day. And everyone was upset with him. And he was told, go home. Don't come like this. You can't wear this to pray. So times have changed. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Now when you look around the room, alhamdulillah, look, right? Most of us are not really wearing traditional back home clothing. Okay? We're wearing clothing that are following the guidelines and principles of Islam. Alhamdulillah, that's perfectly fine. It might be one piece of clothing, two pieces of clothing that, you know, it is a little bit different than the rest of society, but that's perfectly fine. And so we see that Islam has allowed us to grow that way. The problem is, the younger generation doesn't feel comfortable asking. So we need to open our doors to that. So that's one of the things that I just wanted to share with regards to uh, an incident, uh, an issue that I see us uh, having moving forward. A few things that I'll, that I'll mention. You know, when we look at our Muslim community and the achievements of the past, those are great things. But now we need more. And this is where the younger generation needs to work with the older generation. We have the politicians with us. Our youth are interested in politics. They need to learn it. They need to get involved. Very soon, you know what? I actually was in Ottawa doing a lecture once, and I was wearing this same jacket, right? And if you ever see Justin Trudeau wearing a jacket this color? He's in Armenia today, and he's wearing a jacket just like this, right? So I was in Ottawa, and I was wearing this jacket. And we had some delegates from the parliament that came, and we were sitting in the speaker's lounge at the conference. We were sitting down, and they were there, and they're like, hey, you know what? And these are non-Muslims. They're like, you actually look like Justin with, with a beard. <laughs> and I was like, okay, is that a good thing, or am I in trouble now? <laughs> and then I started to talk to them, and I said, you know what's really interesting? Is that I've been told by you that I look like the prime minister with a beard. But when I'm in Quebec, I've been told to go back to my country. And I, as a child, I could never understand that. And that's where I feel we've transitioned a lot. Because as a youth, and, when, and, and, and this is what I'm wrapping up with, I'm bringing this back to the very first thing I started with. When I was in Australia, and I was told, you look like a Canadian, the first thing that came to my mind was that, that when I was growing up, in Canada, I never felt Canadian. You know, I'm born and raised here. I always felt like an outsider. And I realized that I had to stand on my own two feet. And I even had to look at someone, a journalist, in his face with his camera, right, his lens, right here. And he was taking pictures of me in French saying, go back to your country, go back to your country. And I said, je suis québécois, with a hardcore French accent, right? 
Joie de Québec, oui, vive la Québec, right? I'm French, I'm Quebec. I said to him, I said, I'm, I'm a Quebecer. And he was taking pictures of me and he, he moved his head away from the camera and he looked at me, he's like, ah, t'es pas Québécois, toi, and I said, oui, je suis Québécois. Right? And we started like having this dialogue in French. And he was shocked and he put his camera down and he started walking away swearing. And I realized this was just a few years ago. This was a few years ago in an airport terminal, in Montreal airport. He was taking pictures of me in my face. And I was like, you know what? We need to stand up for ourselves. And that's really the message that we learned. Is that as Muslims living in Canada, you're Canadian. You mold this society. We help to spread goodness. We open our doors to the homeless. I remember the very first time I came to Vancouver, some of the you know, community members here, they brought me to East Hastings in the middle of the night. And I've used that example in many, in many lectures around the world. I've told people, you know what? Vancouver is the homeless capital of Canada. I've never seen something that looks like the you know the Tablighi Jamaat, they have the Ishtama, right? Where they gather together for like three days and they sleep on the ground with sleeping bags. They get together and they learn and they study and they research and they, they go out and they teach people. SubhanAllah, I said, it, it reminded me of that, but these are all homeless people sleeping out on the streets in the cold. We as Muslims need to fix that. We are the ones who have to take it upon our shoulders. It's our responsibility. Yes, it's a responsibility of human beings. Yes, it's a responsibility of Canadians to look after others. But we as Muslims have an added responsibility. That we should not go to sleep, as the Prophet teaches us, when our neighbor is hungry. Yet we do it almost every single night. So as Muslims, are we part of Canadian society? Absolutely. Are we happy and proud to be part of this country? Absolutely. This is home. Does history end here? Definitely not. We're making history. We are setting the standards, and we are raising the bar, and we are helping people, and we are showing them that this is the way of Islam, and this is what we do. And alhamdulillah, I'm glad to see, you know, I see Brother Diaz there, I know he's been working with the youth for years. I know his dad and his family have been doing such great things, and I'm, I'm sure there's many of you sitting here, but I just don't know you by name. And I've met you, and, and you've told me the things that you do, and I, I, I know Brother Daoud, and I don't see him right now, but you know, helping out downstairs, and the other brother I met last time I was here, the food bank. It was cold, and they were doing the food banks. Pala, it was nice, it was beautiful. They were giving out food. That's what we do. We need to show that we have no borders. I'll end there, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wa barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu sallam. Wa barakallahu nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakallahu.